everybody. John is super busy all weekend with massive numbers of rehearsals and shows, so he's not here today. But because of that, I'm taking the opportunity to talk about a question today that obviously came from someone who just wanted to give me something to do. And that was someone who wrote in and said that they really loved the Maya Storytime vlog and they wanted us to do one about Hittite mythology because they didn't think they were going to win the poll anytime soon, which is true. They're probably not. And obviously that person just wanted to make me smile, which worked. Um, so I'm going to tell you guys a little bit about a Hindu myth, or not Hindu, Hittite myth today. Um, there are a few of them, a lot, a lot like the Canaanite myths. They tend to be sort of fragmentary because we have them from tablets of stone that have been broken or that have been weathered over the centuries. So sometimes there's words missing and we're not quite sure of the details. But um, the most famous one and the one that you'll usually hear people talk about is the conflict between the storm god Teshub, who's the leader of their pantheon, and the ocean dragon or serpent Iluyanka. And it's an echo myth. You see a lot of it in the same, that area of the world where the storm god fights some kind of serpent antagonist who's often associated with water. Um, a lot of scholars think that it's probably a forerunner to Zeus fighting Typhon. Um, but Typhon, Typhon is not necessarily more badass than Ilyanka because Ilyanka is a major force. He's a giant sea serpent. Um, he's incredibly strong. He's very difficult to defeat. The difference actually lies with Teshub, who's the storm god leader of the Pantheon, and he's most often compared to Baal, because he's very similar in that he has, uh, when there were droughts, they would blame that on, oh, he was losing against Ilyanka, and he needed to be resurrected or saved, um, and he's a rain god, and he's a fertility god, and he's got a lot of similar connotations that Baal does. But the difference is that Teshub can't really handle things by himself the way a lot of storm god leaders can. He's not a Marduk who can just roll out there and defeat things by himself. Uh, he usually needs help. And so there are a lot of versions of the myth of him fighting Ilyanka, depending on where you are within the Hittite Empire, which, by the way, is modern-day Turkey, mostly. Um, and so you'll get versions where Teshub will fight Ilyanka, and he'll lose. And then he'll fight Ilyanka, and he'll lose again. And then the third time, he'll come and bring his whole pantheon with him, and then they'll, they'll succeed. But Teshub couldn't fight him by himself. Um, in another version, he fights and he loses, and he's so terrified he can't refight this guy, and he's kind of... Um, it's maybe a dying fertility god myth. It's kind of ambiguous whether or not he's actually dead or he's just kind of injured and out of commission. And in that version, he has a daughter, Inara, who is the goddess of kind of sexuality and all that fun stuff. And so she takes it upon herself to go call up. First, she goes to a mortal town and she says, Hey, I'm picking you, mortal guy. I need you to come help me with this plan. And the mortal man says, well, I'll do that, but I want you to sleep with me first. And she's like, yeah, that seems fair. You know, I'm going to go probably get you killed now, so... So he gets to have sex with the goddess, and then they go off to uh, to go try to defeat Ilyanka so that her father can come back. And when they go to they go to the cave where Ilyanka and his children live, and she calls down that she's holding a super huge feast to celebrate his victory, and he should come out, and it's going to be awesome. And he's so moved by her charms and her feminine wiles, and she does some sexy dancing to convince him to come out, that he does. And uh, she does indeed hold a giant feast for him. And she, the major feature of that feast is that it's full of alcohol. So he and his children get roaringly drunk, maybe literally roaringly because they're dragons. And uh, while they're kind of drunk and passed out, then Teshub is able to come in and defeat them. Uh, it's not really clear why the mortal needed to be there, but uh, some scholars think that it maybe is a callback to a mortal cult where a priestess would impersonate the goddess and then she would pick one man to impersonate the mortal. And it's uh, one of those where the divine comes together with the mortal things. Um, so that's another version of where Teshu needs help to defeat his arch enemy, but it does eventually get there. And then the third and most well-known version is also the most tragic and sad, and it's another good example of gods just kind of being jerks. Um, in this version, Teshu fights Ilyanka and he loses, and Ilyanka takes his heart and eyes to prevent him from ever being a threat again, which again echoes that myth of Zeus losing his sinews to Typhon and having to have them return to him. So Teshub is terrified of him and can't do anything because he's blind and he doesn't have a heart and there's nothing he can do. So he goes out and intentionally marries a mortal woman and has a son, who would be the first Hittite scion if we were happening to put this in the scion universe. And then he sends that son off to marry the daughter of Ilyanka. So now his son is also Ilyanka's son-in-law. And now this part of the story depends on a weird clause in Hittite marriage law which basically, the Hittites didn't do dowries, they did bride prices, which means that when you marry a girl, you pay your father for the privilege of taking her. Um, but if your father was already very wealthy and he didn't need you to pay him, you could instead offer to be a live-in husband who lives at his house and works for him, and then he'll pay you a bride price. So 
Teshub sends his son and tells him, go do this. Um, you'll live with him as an, a live-in husband. And ask for him, for me, as your bride price, to give you my heart and eyes. So the son does that because he's like, this looks good. You know, we're going to foster family harmony. And he gives the heart and eyes back to Teshub. And then Teshub is like, okay, I'm going out to murder him. And the son is like, what? You can't murder him. He's my father-in-law. I live with him. I work for him. He's my friend. And Teshub is like, well, that was the entire point of this all along. I'm going to go do that. And so he goes and fights Ilyanka, and this time he succeeds. And uh, the son comes running up as he's about to deliver the death blow, and it's like, you can't. Don't do this. And Teshub is like, I'm doing it. You don't have any say in this. You're just, I had you as a son specifically to get to this point. That's why you exist. And so the son says, well, I'm part of his family. I married his daughter, and I love her, and we're all part of that family. So if you're going to kill him, you have to kill me too. So Teshub does. He kills his own son, and he kills his own daughter-in-law, and he kills Ilyanka. And he is supreme, and he goes back to ruling the Pantheon, but he's kind of a big dick. Which is not really surprising for storm gods in ancient mythology. So you can see Teshub is interesting because he's one of those like large and in charge storm gods who's, I'm the king of the Pantheon, and he throws a lot of tantrums if people don't respect his authority. But he also doesn't really do the single combat thing very well. He tends to lose, he tends to need help, or he tends to need uh, some kind of a a sort of ruse to get to where he's trying to go. And uh, obviously the Hittites didn't see anything wrong with that, or at least, you know, they thought he was still in charge. They were completely fine with that. So there's a lot of scholarly theorizing about, is that because they thought Teshub was too important as the storm god and the fertility god, so he had to be in charge, even if he was kind of lame? Or is it because they thought, you know, guile like that, or, you know, working together as a team is a good thing, and that should be encouraged. And so it's not a uh, failing of his that he can't do things in single combat because he's doing them cooperatively and that's good. Um, we don't really know because it's hard to know a lot about social economics and politics in the Hittite Empire. It was a long time ago, <laughs> but people are still working on it and you know people are still working on translating the, the weird little cuneiform symbols that we have to tell us these myths. Um, I'm not going to go into all of the Hittite myths because you know there are quite a few and a lot of them repeat themselves. Uh, one of the really big themes is the bees, and I love the bees because it's a ridiculous thing that you don't see in other mythologies, and I think that's really cool. Uh, basically, there's a recurring story where a god will go missing, and in one, it's Telepuri, I'm pronouncing his name wrong, I don't have it in front of me, uh, who is the god of like farming and fertility, and he goes missing, and everybody freaks out because you know the, the land isn't growing or anything. Uh, another one, it's the sun god Arina who goes missing, and uh, in every one of these cases. There's the goddess Hanahana, who's kind of the, the matriarch of the Pantheon, and she has magic bees. And these are like magic homing bees, and she sends them out whenever a god is missing, and they find that god. And sometimes they just leave the god home. Sometimes if they think the god is being kind of a bitch, they sting him until he comes home, and then she calms him down. Um, but basically they solve a lot of their problems. Anytime a god is missing, they're like, well, let's bust out the homing bees, and that'll take care of this. So... I think that's pretty fun and hilarious. I would love to see a sign that had homing bees of some form. Um, so there are a lot of myths that do that, and there are a lot more myths surrounding the Teshub versus Ilyanka rivalry um, that keeps going on. And uh, I think that uh, it would be a little bit much to explain all of them because they're mostly similar with like one different feature. But that's a, a basic, here's a myth for you from Hittite mythology. They're super cool. And they were a pretty major empire back in the day, you know, before the Persians rose, but slightly after the Mesopotamians fell. Um, I know that they're never going to win that poll, guys, so you guys don't need to feel bad for me. I am a realist, I understand that, but they are one of my secret favorites, so thank you for letting me indulge myself today, and we'll see you guys next week.